All righty. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I honestly thought we were going to have a really light crowd tonight because of the rain, but you guys are awesome. Seriously, braving the rain and coming out here and listening to me talk about how you can sleep better. I appreciate it. For those folks who don't know me, I'm Dr. Nancy Bertelman. This is my clinic, Lakeland Natural Health, and I'm a chiropractor. I'm a pharmacist, and under chiropractic, I do nutrition response testing. So we here, we look at the muscle testing technique and acupuncture points to find out which organs are working well, which ones are not working as optimally. We use whole food supplements to fill in the blank while we're looking at the diet. So we want to make sure that you're getting good quality food and the music is still on. <laughs> So we want to make sure that we're helping you to change your diet to good quality food because we Americans eat way too many high sugar, high processed foods and it actually robs our body of nutrients which are essential for getting us healthy and keeping us healthy. And so we want to kind of transition from a high processed, high sugar diet to something that has a lot more good quality foods in it with the raw ingredients that we need to survive. Tonight we're going to talk about sleeping and what are some of the things that we can do to help us get a better night's sleep and what might be interrupting that sleep. So amazingly enough, sleep is still elusive to the scientific community and we don't actually know why we have to sleep. What we do know is that it is essential for human beings to get a good quality night's sleep. We have all gone through some phase in our life when we're not sleeping optimally. We feel grouchy, we feel sick, we feel fuzzy headed, we just don't feel good and as that lack of sleep continues on for days, we can actually physically become ill. And so sleep is a very important part of the fact that we have to heal and we have to rest. Sleep is also an uncontrollable impulse. Even though we're having sleepless nights, our body desires to sleep. So for those of us who wake up in the middle of the night or who can't fall asleep, we feel very frustrated. Why can't I sleep? Why am I not sleeping? I don't feel good not sleeping. And so it is a drive in us just like eating or breathing air. If we're not breathing, we get very anxious. If we're not sleeping, we get very anxious. Sleeping, they do know, goes through stages. They've used EEGs, which are monitors that they can put on the brain, uh, brain waves, looking to find out where we are in sleep patterns. There are five stages of sleep. Stage one is going to be light sleep. So this is when you just fall asleep and the kids yell, Mom, and you jump up. Or the dog barks, or you hear a noise outside, and you're like, what was that? That's stage one sleep. So stage one, we're going to be normal muscle tone, we're going to be normal breathing, and it's going to be very easy to get us up. Stage two, we're falling into a little bit deeper sleep. We're less capable of waking up, but someone who really needs us to get up can roust us with a shake or a loud noise or a loud bang in the background. Stage three and stage four are very deep sleep. We're going to be very difficult to wake up. It's going to be that person where you're shaking them and yelling their name and you're like, why aren't you getting up? It's because their brains have fallen into stage three, stage four sleep, and physiologically, it is impossible to get that body moving. Stage five is called REM, or rapid <coughs> eye movement. And if you're looking at a person in stage five, you'll actually see their eyes moving underneath their eyelids. And this is also when we have dreams. We don't stay in one stage throughout the entire night and we don't go through stage one through five and end in stage five in the morning. We actually cycle through sleeping patterns throughout the entire night. So we'll fall asleep, we'll go into deep sleep, we'll end up in REM, we'll come back into light sleep, we'll go back into deep sleep, go back into REM, and we'll cycle through these multiple times a night. We all know sometimes we'll get up in the middle of the night and go to the bathroom. Sometimes we'll remember turning over and getting more comfortable. Those are all times of sleep during the cycles when we're at our lightest sleep and we can actually move and do something. 
REM sleep usually occurs about 70 to 90 minutes after we fall asleep first thing at night. We're going to have a complete sleep cycle, take about 90 to 110 minutes, depending upon the situation. Are you comfortable? Are you feeling well? Are, do we have to get up to go to the bathroom? Did we drink lots of water before we went to sleep? So depending upon how comfortable we are, it will depend on whether we stay in a particular cycle for a, a period of time. The first periods when we're first falling asleep are going to last longer and REM is going to be shorter in the beginning of our sleep cycle. So we fall asleep, we're going to stay in phase one through five a lot longer and REM a lot shorter. And as the night goes on, REM is going to become longer and the other stages of sleep will become shorter. Everybody needs a little bit different time in bed. Our newborn babies are going to need 14 to 17 hours of sleep. That's pretty amazing. They spend most of their time sleeping. And that makes sense when you realize that when we're sleeping, we're healing, we're growing, we're creating tissue, and we're repairing. And they cannot be more metabolically active than when they are little tiny babies. You get them, they're six to eight pounds. And in a couple of weeks, they're 10 pounds. And in a couple of more weeks, they're 15 pounds. And, you know, it doesn't take very long for this tiny little baby to get quite a bit of weight on it. Toddlers, 11 to 14, are age school children, preschool children, somewhere between 9 and 11. We've all gone through school ourselves. And when little kids are grouchy in the morning, it's because they did not get enough sleep. Teenagers and everyone after the teenage years somewhere between 8 and 10 hours a day. As we get older, we do typically need less sleep, but we really don't fall much less than 8 hours a day. And 8 hours, 6 to 8 hours is going to be optimum for everyone. The circadian rhythm is our sleep-wake cycle rhythm, which is a natural rhythm that is ingrained in our brains. So the circadian rhythm is going to be our biological clock that works with the suprachiasmic nucleus, say that one five times fast, which is basically a group of cells in the hypothalamus. Remember, for those of you who are working with me with some hormonal balancing, the hypothalamus is the information pathway of our body. It's going to be sampling our body's hormonal system and telling the pituitary gland, thyroid needs a little bit of uprising, ovaries, testicles, adrenals. Our pineal gland is responsible for producing melatonin, which is part of our sleep-wake cycle. So the hormonal control of our body is very, very important. Hypothalamus is going to be the driver of pituitary gland sending information to the organ systems responsible for those hormones, which are messengers. Melatonin is simply a messenger to the body that it's time to go to sleep. When melatonin levels drop, the body starts to wake up because cortisol levels rise. Hormone balance. So this is why we need hormone balance. This is what happens unbeknownst to us on a daily basis. The body is an amazing, amazing organism. Light actually signals the hypothalamus that it's time to wake up. So it's very difficult for us to do the night shift thing. And for those of us who have done the night shift thing, we know how hard that is to try to fall asleep in the middle of the day and try to be awake at nighttime. The circadian clock, I think you got a copy of the circadian clock, otherwise I can post it on Facebook. But when I'm asking you, what time are you waking up at night? And you're telling me, I am consistently, if I open my eyes, it is 2.30 in the morning. That's going to give me a very good clue as to what organ system might be giving you a hard time, might need a little bit of support, and in that case, it's the liver. If you notice, the large intestines are between 5 and 7 a.m., and for most humans, we have to poop between 5 and 7 a.m. And that's the way the body is meant to do it. And for those of us who are having trouble 
pooping between 5 and 7 a.m., we're going to keep on working on that because that's our goal is to get you pooping between 5 and 7 a.m. The number one sleep disorder that we all know about is insomnia. One in three adults has occasional insomnia and one in 10 adults has chronic insomnia. More often, insomnia, insomnia is difficulty sleeping or difficulty falling asleep, waking up early in the mornings, two or three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning, or a feeling of being tired once we do wake up. We're not actually going through all of our cycles of sleep and so we're not waking up recuperative. Some other things that can cause a bad night's sleep. Restless leg syndrome is nervous impulses making us feel like we have to move our legs through the night. We're not calm and relaxed. Leg cramping wakes us up because we get these huge muscle cramps in our legs, our toes, our calves, or our hamstrings, and it can be very painful. And more often than not, it requires us to physically stand up in order to stretch that muscle out properly so that we can get some sleep. Sleep apnea is difficulty or the inability to breathe quietly and consistently through the night. Uh, it is not uncommon for men to show more problems with sleep apnea, at least in the past. Folks that are fairly heavy can have sleep apnea and the idea is that they're closing down the trachea and the airways are having problems. Snoring, another problem, waking people up. Normally it bothers the spouse more than it bothers the person snoring. And narcolepsy, the inability to actually stay up. These people are falling asleep throughout the day and so they're not sleeping consistently at night. We have an entire handout all to itself on good tips for getting a good night's sleep. So for those folks having problems sleeping, this is a great way to start good sleeping habits. Um, it's the National Sleep Foundation, and I found a lot of great information on the National Sleep Foundation's website. Uh, scheduling time to go to bed, making sure that you're doing all of your nighttime chores. You're eating dinner, you're cleaning your kitchen, you're taking your shower, brushing your teeth, and getting ready for bed and going to bed at about the same time every night. 10 o'clock is a good time to shoot for. After 10 o'clock, we're just not going to get the same quality sleep as we're going to get before the midnight hour. Some of us can handle that, some of us can't, some of us can do it, some of us can't do it, but getting to bed around 10 o'clock at night is going to give us the best possibility of getting to sleep and falling asleep and having a good eight hours of sleep at night. Exercise is a great way to keep the body healthy, including helping us sleep at night. Now, we're not talking about sleep going to exercise before we go to sleep. We would like to exercise in the morning. It makes the heart strong. It helps us with our breathing mechanics. It helps us to become tired. This is a morning, early afternoon activity. We don't want to be exercising about 30, 45 minutes or an hour before we go to bed. Exercise requires us to increase our cortisol levels, maybe increase our adrenaline, increase our breathing, increase our heart rate, potentially increase our blood pressure, and all of those things are a counter to falling asleep quickly and being peaceful while we're sleeping. So exercise is something that should be done in the early part of the day so that it can be beneficial for us to fall asleep. Avoiding caffeine, nicotine, and alcohol. All of these things can be detrimental to us falling asleep. Some folks are very sensitive to caffeine. If you are sensitive to caffeine and you drink a caffeinated drink, whether it's a Coca-Cola or a tea or a coffee, after two or three o'clock in the afternoon, it can adversely affect your ability to fall asleep. Nicotine can also be a stimulant, and alcohol is not only a sugar, but it is also a neurotoxin, and you need your neurology, your hormones, your brain to cooperate with us to get you to sleep properly. 
The thing about alcohol also is that because it's a sugar, it's going to increase your insulin levels. If insulin levels go up, the pituitary does not produce growth hormone. Growth hormone is responsible for healing your body while we're sleeping. So alcohol is also a neurotoxin. The liver has to be very active to get rid of alcohol. Alcohol is one of those things that might wake you up around two or three o'clock at night. One, your body's gonna have to urinate to get rid of the alcohol because it's a toxin. Two, your liver has to stay active when the liver's trying to heal instead. So alcohol is one of those things that we try to avoid. So in general, what we say is if we can reduce our sugars after before six o'clock. So we eat whatever we can eat before six o'clock. So if we're gonna have a fruit, we're gonna have an alcoholic beverage, we're gonna take those things before six o'clock and give our bodies a good long time to metabolize it out and get rid of it before we go to bed. Relaxing before bed. Now we are a technologically advanced society and so our idea of relaxing these days is going to be the iPad and the iPhone and ebooks. But those blue lights that those phones emit actually stimulate us. They do not help us fall asleep. Reading a good old fashioned hard book, watching something a little bit funny. We definitely don't want to be watching horror movies and getting our adrenaline all up and our heart beating in our throat because we're scared to death. So we want to watch something relaxing. We want to do something relaxing. Go spend time rocking on the porch. Go spend time petting the dog. Do something that's relaxing. <clears throat> Keeping a consistent schedule and working with the circadian rhythm would mean that we are up with the sunrise. So using blackout curtains might be detrimental to balancing out that circadian rhythm because we want that sunlight to start streaming in when the sun starts coming up. It helps us to get a rhythm and a routine so that we stay in balance. And if you do get up and you're tossing and turning, please don't stay in bed. As you're tossing and turning, your anxiety is going up. Why am I not sleeping? Why can't I fall asleep? What's happening? Get up, go do something relaxing, read that book pet the dog, do something that you like, and then when you feel tired again, come back to bed. Controlling the room temperature, so of course making sure that you're not too hot or too cold. And for those of us who have spouses and one person wants the room one temperature and the other person wants the room another, having your own blanket, that way you don't have to share. The other person can throw off the blanket and be as cold as they wanna be and you can have that nice blanket on your body and be as warm. So being comfortable, because if we're too cold or too hot, that's going to wake us up as well. And some foods that will generally increase our ability to produce better melatonin, relax and fall asleep, are going to be your poultry. Everybody knows about Thanksgiving turkey. Eat a lot of Thanksgiving turkey and everybody's falling asleep at the football game. Fish, yogurt, kale, bananas, nuts, and eggs are all great foods. They're going to be full of good quality fats, and they're also going to help our body produce melatonin um, through their processes.